So uh, first of all, like all the slides and all the demo materials would be um, uh, as what they have already like been put on GitHub and uh, it's um, located at this place, which belongs to H2O AI and go to H2O, AI, uh, H2O uh, dash meetups and just um, scroll down and go find today's. Yeah, and it's right here. There's like one, one PDF slice and also three um, demo Python notebooks. So, um, all right, so let's do this. Um, like, um, like the topic is parallel evasion optimization. Actually, this is um, pretty difficult and dense materials, but uh, I'm just going to um, first of all, like introduce like some basics to this and it's gonna be, um, like in four, 45 minutes and our agenda first of all like the introduction and then we're going to talk about some like basics um moving on to two of the most important parts of patient optimization which is um custom process and also uh precision function um last uh last week we we're going to talk about the uh, parallelization okay so um, how many of you guys have like fitted a model like during the past two weeks? Please raise your hands. And how many of you guys have like um, like fitted a model today? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you guys still remember like what is the longest time of you guys like tuning a uh, machine learning model, whatever is that? Anyone? Yes, or like you feel like this model doesn't work or it's a crappy model and we're going to discuss that. Once? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so like actually in today's research or whatever like um, happening in the industry, like some models that are really complicated and you could like spend days or months or um, even years to tune the model or just to run it once. So um, you really want to like uh, limit that time you spend like um, to reproduce um, the whole like model with a different set of parameters. Um, like you could meet all kinds of like parameters in your models um, and like some, some are like just model parameters and some are called hyperparameters. For the hyperparameters, you like, um, it means like something you can choose and you could like make this model more flexible and such as like uh, when you're fitting a bridge regression, which is like a um, regularization of linear regression and you have like a regularizer lambda, and also like in your network, maybe like you, you can choose like how many layers are you going to fit or how many neurons uh, on one layer or like the batch size or the other kind of stuff. And in a, like when you're building a random forest, you could choose like how many trees you want to have or like uh, how many, what is the maximum um, nodes uh, you want to have like in one uh, uh, maximum number of rows you can have in one uh, leaf point. So all kinds of um, hyperparameters like they all, all of them just like stack up and making the model more flexible but also they're making you uh, really hard to choose a really great set of parameters. So now what, what, what are you going to do? Your um, yeah, this is just like a abstract of like our um, problem. So you see like in this model, we only have like two parameters, uh, two hyper parameters, which is uh, C to I and C to J. And in this like very abstract, like it might be a little harder for some of you guys to um, understand about this, but I'll just tell you like for these four points, they represent like uh, the maximum or the like what, it, what kind of value is like, um, the biggest in this model and so like your problem can be uh, formalized as this like C to star equals to R min um, when you're choosing C to from like uh, uh, some kind of evaluation actually like there is a there is a typo right here there should be like some kind of uh, specific function right here but like um, R min this means like you when you're choosing uh, 
when you're choosing the uh, set of parameters, which is CETA star, star means like it's optimal. And when you're choosing CETA star, in order to minimize this uh, function, actually, there, there should be something here. So, um, yeah, um, what is the best set of hack parameters to optimize this chosen model? Um, so this this picture actually from like uh, one medium post uh, last night actually, and it's some typical list of the convolution on your network training hyperparameters. You see, it's like you got so so many options, and like for nonlinearity, for batch normalization, pooling, classification design, info size, data set size, there are all kinds of um, variants, but what makes it worse is like you're not doing the addition of like all kinds of choices, but instead you're doing like multiplications, which will make this really worse. What does it feel like? It feels like when you're trying to dig in something and you don't know what you're digging about. Like you have all kinds of people all around, you're digging from different directions, but like what am I searching for? And how do I know the values? So you don't want to do it yourself or you, you don't want to do it by hand. You could use some kind of automated um, hyperparameter search algorithms. There's um, some really uh, simple, um, simple examples of this. Like the first one, first thought of this is you can do in a grid search. What is grid search? This means like you're building a giant, huge uh, grid inside of your uh, hyperparameter space. And you see like in our C to I, C to J space, we have like nine points. Each point represents one um, pair of these uh, hyperparameters. And you're evaluating one by one. So yeah, this is like kind of um, brute force or just like linear thoughts of this. And there are codes right here. You could, you guys could try it as well. And um, so, like, we have built a like baseline searching like um, strategy. Right now, um, what else can we think of? Like, apart from just like linearly create a like um, grid or like evaluating points like one by one. Some people are thinking of this. Like they could like choose some kind of like um, searching, searching like patterns, like doing a spiral, doing parallel, doing like searching within a zoom. Like these kinds of stuff are another are not gonna work as well. So now you would be asking yourself, like, what if I just like search it randomly and I just like search this point and then I move to another point. It doesn't have to be like some kind of like um, um, norms or what kind of um, regulations for... Can we adjust the focus, please? Pardon? Can we adjust the focus? On okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alright, so um, now you're thinking of like if I could just do it uh, randomly and you could like choose some kind of random points. And then you only are uh, going to evaluate uh, based on like some promising like points from your random search. And there's a paper on this. Um, if you're interested in doing this, you could try it or using them um, using using like uh, existing factors or like go read the paper. But um, we're still doing something like randomly. Can we do something better? Like some some kind of like educated guess. Like based on what I have evaluated before and um, in order to make a decision of what I'm going to evaluate next. So that's uh, Bayesian optimization. Um, now we are going to talk, like now, uh, before we are going to talk, talk about something in uh, Bayesian optimization, we're going to talk about uh, some fundamentals, just uh, in, uh, like to like a, a revision kind of. So, um, the very basics, uh, review of probability. Now we have two events, A and B. A is, is raining and B is the ground is wet. And um, 
where now we can have some like probability like distribution of um, each, each event. So probability of A is the probability that is raining and probability of B is probably the ground is wet. And also you can have some like very complicated like uh, probabilities like the um, conditional probabilities such as uh, P uh, of B given A, which means probability of the ground is wet given it is raining, and also um, joint probabilities, which means like the two uh, event happens uh, at the same time. Uh, in this case, it means like probabilities it's raining and the ground is wet. There are also some kind of uh, calculation um, uh, the rules you need to know, uh, like the first one, the um, uh, like PA B equals to PA given B times PB, which means like um, like PA uh, PA given B means like when B happens, then A happens at the same time, and you times it was like the probability of B happens. This like intuitively given you like. Um, what is the probability of like the two things happen together? And like vice versa, if we have like A at the um, like conditional term and we have like uh, uh, the second function. And so also like PA means like uh, one, one small thing happened, oh, like A happened and we we're given like all um, situations of like B and we're like um, adding them up together. And similarly, like uh, we have like PB. So moving on to Bayes' rule, which is like the really basics of uh, Bayesian stuff. And now you want to um, say something about like the conditional probability of B given that A happened. Bayes' rule lets you um, Let's just say the probability of B after knowing A is like P, B of uh, when B happens and A happens at the same time. And this specific uh, condition uh, is like uh, denominated by PA. So um, there are names for each terms. Uh, on the left, left hand side, the P, um, left hand side, P, B given A, which is the posterior and this term is the likelihood, which means like the possibility of this specific thing happens, and PB means the prior, is our like prior beliefs, and what is the um, denominator here, right here, is the marginal or the evidence. So also we'll be using a lot uh, of like Gaussian distribution right now. Uh, please notice like uh, right here on the left left corner is like just another kind of um, representation of this because like usually you'll be seeing like uh, the normal distribution would be there would be sigma square which means the um, the virus and um, uh, the density which is the PDF uh, probability density distribution uh, of this X X is a random variable uh, suppose this X uh, satisfied from satisfying this normal distribution and then we have this density following this term. Like uh, one of my uh, statistical uh, professor actually pointed out like this is one of the uh, weirdest or the um, most, it's just like one of the most uh, weirdest equation of the world because it has like the square root, also pi, also like expectation. So it's like something if you want to want to know and yeah and also if we take log of this density we're getting the uh, third equation which is like the very first term is just going to be a constant and it's not going to be one of our interests and expectation just like you, when you put this whole term right here so also, you will be hearing a lot about like probabilistic model. Um, what is a probabilistic model? Probabilistic model is just a set of prob probability distributions. While um, you don't really know the parameters, theta, and you just know it belongs to a certain kind of like distribution family. And 
in the previous like slides, we introduced like the Gaussian distribution, and in that distribution, our parameters uh, would just be uh, mu and sigma, which is like the main value and the um, covariance. All right. So also we're going to talk about maximum likelihood and. What is maximum likelihood? Like in short, maximum likelihood means um, something that is um, most po most possible to happen. And like there there is a definition before that, which is the uh, IID assumption, independent and identical distributed. This is like really something you can understand from from the um, each word and. It means like um, each of the random variable, they are independent and also they satisfy from the same identical distribution. So yeah, and um, based on the ID assumption, now the joint density function, the joint density function is like, um, remember this term, and we have introduced the uh, joint distribution before, and the joint dis uh, density function is just gonna be the product of all the uh, individual points their uh, point density. And um, so what is maximum likelihood? Maximum likelihood is just um, seeking the value of theta that um, uh, maximize the likelihood function. So um, now we see like arc max again, which is like to find the uh, maximum set of parameters that maximize this, this function. And it's like we're searching for the um, best set of like parameters in order to maximize our likelihood of this thing could happen. So um, now how do we solve this like maximization function? We take gradients of that. And if we are going to take gradients of that, then we have to like compute in a lot of the stuff, especially if we are having some um, product of some, some stuff. There are some kind of tricks that could like um, like reduce your computation from like doing the pro uh, product um, into doing some uh, addition of that, which is the logarithm trick. Um, logarithm trick basically is just um, when you have something um, like you, when you have a times b and you're taking log to that whole product, and then you could just then that could just be viewed as like log a plus log b. And it really like turns the um, it really like uh, turns uh, yeah it turns the um, addition uh, it turns the product or division into addition or uh, subtraction, and so yeah so like right now um, um, another yeah there there is one more there is one more trick right here it's like. Um, when you're maximizing this G function, and it's actually um, like for, uh, it's actually the same as uh, maximizing one of this monotone transformation. So if if you don't know this kind of stuff, you can like uh, talk to me after like uh, this or after a Q and A. And right, so any questions right now? All right, so now we're going to talk about like the Bayesian optimization. And there will be two, uh, two of the most important uh, definitions or points uh, within Bayesian optimization. One is Gaussian process, and the other is uh, acquisition function. So we're going to begin from Gaussian process. Um, we start from linear regression. Um, so, the linear regression model can be written as like a constant term plus all kinds of like its feature space times like the uh, coefficients. And we have our training data ready, x1, y1, to like xn or yn, and this like x1, they could also be like, um, like it's actually some kind of um, like vectors. It could be like x11, x12, to x1d, and xn could be like x, xn1, x, xn2, to xnd. And now we want to use them to um, learn a set of weights such that like this weights could 
make our esti estimation um, just like really close to our like to the observed values. So um, there's one trick called uh, least square um, least square objective function. It's um, actually asking you to choose the betas, which is the, which are the coefficients that uh, minimize the sum of squared arrows. So what is like the sum of squared arrows? It's just when you're fitting a straight line and you have like points of your observed values into your like theoretical model and you're like trying to minimize like the like the gap between like the points at your um, fitted line and you're like summing that up and you're trying to minimize that. So we have this like uh, least, least square estimator beta is right now. And so, um, yeah, so um, one of the intuitive way to imagine this is just as I said, like it's some kind of straight line. You fitted a straight line. And after you have like fitted the straight line, then what should you gonna be doing? Like you're, you're, you're going to be thinking, like am I going to extend this model to make them more flexible? And there are two easiest ways to make the most more flexible. One is to do some regularization, which you can like penalize those kind of uh, grasters. Um, you could you have an L2 distance of like bridge um, method and L1 distance lasso. And you can also like uh, adding priors to this. Uh, um, so uh, there's one more point that I need to point out is like the, um, maximum likelihood method that we just talked before, it shares the same um, solution to the least square, um, least, least square method that we use uh, under the Gaussian assumption, specifically. If you want to know more tricks or the computation, uh, I could like send you a link or uh, we can talk after this. So right now we're going to fit a prior to this and this, this, uh, this method is, talked, uh, is called MAP. Um, which stand for uh, maximum of posteriori. And so like in maximum likelihood method, you actually like um, assume your model satisfies this um, assumption, which is like why um, is similar from like n equals this. This is like what we have, what we have estimated. And this term comes from the uh, error term. So like the error term directly process, uh, presented in your model and we have like it clearly like represented, and we have using our log tricks, and we have uh, uh, expli explicitly um, written out our um, solution to this. And what what does MAP differ from maximum likelihood? So it's only about like add, we are adding a prior to um, to the beta we are fitting. So. Um, Using our um, base rule that we introduced before, and and using our um, log like the, uh, log tricks, and we are going to write write down the posterior distribution. So like this term right here, it should it should just be like the posterior distribution instead of the uh, maximum likelihood. And then we could make this um, using log tricks. We can make this a um, just a plus and a minus, and Yes, and we can also like explicitly uh, written down all the forms. Uh, please notice like this term, the evidence term actually has nothing to do with what we are trying to maximize. So when we're, um, when we're writing down from the first to the second equation, we take them out. It's not related. So um, what, we, what we have just, just finished are um, the point estimates. What are point estimates mean? Uh, it means like when you're having some estimate for this kind of specific point of um, your coefficients, and you think that's it. Like so, you're like all your estimation are based on just one point. But actually, there are like bigger like um, parameter space that you can choose from, which we're going to talk next, which is the um, which we are going to the full Bayesian inference. The full Bayesian inference means like right now you don't, you are now right, uh, you're now limited to that one point, but instead you have like this point um, 
so it's not like like sitting in some kind of distribution. So like you have a Gaussian bell curve, and you only have like like one point right here. But instead of that one point, you have like now a distribution of that. You have like say maybe this point in the middle is like twenty percent of the um, probability, and maybe the other point is like fifty percent of uh, the probability. And then you're trying to integrate out over like this curve. You're uh, integrated out your like hyperparameter space. So um, this like really enabled us to take into account the uncertainty associated with the limited data instead of like just just finding the point estimates. So um, we have talked about like uh, fitting a least square model or the maximum likelihood on a Gaussian assumption. This is you're fitting a straight line. But right now, instead, you're actually um, trying to integrate it over multiple straight lines. Say, if you have like um, the variation only uh, uh, on your constant term, which is like uh, uh, you can uh, shift this line. And instead of like just fitting one straight line, you have like at this position, it's like 20% uh, of pro uh, pro probability. Uh, the other position is like 50% of probability. And then you're trying to integrate all those like um, lines. So um, this is called the Bayesian linear regression. And the setting is, as I said, like you right now have a prior over your hyperparameters. And um, you could like specify this as like zero mean, and this is the precision, which is like the um, inverse uh, variance. And this is the original like likelihood. So, um, as I said, like Bayesian linear regression, it takes into account the imperfect information and makes subjective guesses with insufficient data. Because why we why we say that that is subjective? Because we're choosing a prior. We're we're like um, we say like this hyperparameter says would just be this kind of um, distribution, and and that is subjective. We don't know like if that's really. Um, it's like true um, probability of like just being that being that point. Okay, so the next uh, definition that I'm going to review is in, in a product. Um, the inner product of two vectors is just like um, each uh, is this each uh, this n should be right here. Um, it's just like each term. Um, a1 times B1, A2 times B2, so An times Bn. And um, there is a, um, there is a, um, there is another, um, there is another uh, expression of inner product. Um, it can be viewed as the simplest kernel function. So kernel function is another like um, high level definition. It's, um, you could like represent them as, as like one vector transpose times the other um, vector. So right now, uh, this is like equal to the double product actually, where you have it like one vector times the other vector, you could like um, just give it this transpose. And it's, it's the same as like the top product. Okay, so what does kernel tricks um, benefit us? Kernel tricks actually added more flexibility to um, this model without changing the algorithms. Like, if we take um, why, uh, like, like first of all, why we are using in the product of that? That is, that comes from like our solution to the um, uh, ML MAP or um, the other solutions. So I, I haven't like put them down like specifically, but like. Uh, you could check them out, like there are inner products related in that. And the kernel tricks actually didn't change the model itself, but only change about like what's similar to that inner product. So if we have like kernels being added to that, um, to that model, instead of like uh, the original inner product, then we could add some more flexibility. Right now, like there are tons of literatures uh, where like, um, yeah, there, there are a lot of like literatures um, thinking of coming up with different kernels that are going to change the problem, different kernels that are going to like be better for the models. So if we add in the kernel tricks to our um, Bayesian linear regression, we actually um, have expanded our um, model to um, 
more flexible way. And right. And there are um, some common kernels. I'm not going to um, cover any of them, but like you could check them out if you're really interested. And so um, to sum up, right now we have just built a Gaussian process model. We have moved from uh, linear regression to Bayesian linear regression, and finally to Gaussian process model by adding the kernel tricks. And right now we are having our priors. Notice this F is just like the X times beta is your mean. And we have we have our priors and we have our likelihood. And um, we could we could go uh, through the um, Bay through we use like prior times likelihood and is um, is going to be um, the posterior and we're um, um, we're we're utilize we're uh, utilizing one first uh, very important problem uh, property of like a Bayesian inference which is the uh, conjugate prior which means you are having some specific uh, uh, distribution of prior and you have any kind of like likelihood of Actually, it should still be like a specific kind of likelihood, but when you're computing the posterior, the posterior is going to be with the same uh, distribution category as the prior. It's called uh, conjugate prior. So um, right now, um, why we're choosing, why we're doing this all in Gaussian is because like Gaussian prior is a um, uh, conjugate prior to itself, and if uh, like specifically, if we are having a Gaussian prior Gaussian likelihood, then our posterior is also going to be Gaussian. So we have calculated the posterior, the mean, the variance. If you're really interested, you can like compute them by hand. And yeah, right now you can see like we are substituting the covariance, which should be the um, which should be the uh, inner product into a kernel. And like uh, in the main environment function, we have like kernels everywhere. Um, like this specific term is like um, your new point, and its uh, kernel value uh, corresponding to the uh, original data that you have. And like the small k is just like uh, the new point uh, corresponding to itself and the kernel value of that. So. Um, Right, so I'm, I'm going to do a demo of Gaussian process. So, um, right now, um, like this is uh, a function that I built, and this is the confidence in the interval of that, and this is the true value, and what I'm trying to do right now is to sample some points. There are the training points for our Gaussian process. And first of all, some of you may say like it might be good if we're fitting a um, polynomial model. If like um, like x x squared doesn't work, maybe you can have like x cube or x uh, x uh, to a uh, like to a dimension of four to a degree of four. And this is what it, what we got. If we have like polynomial degree of two, four, six, we we cannot like fit into this this specific function that we have created very well. And now we are trying to build a Gaussian process progression. Um, so um, what's next is uh, I'm going to hand compute in like all the um, kernel functions and the gradients of that. But um, just remember, like all, all of these stuff you can do just by using some packages like Cycler, H2O, they all have like such kind of functions. And I'm defining a kernel function, defining a um, like quadratic. This is the uh, kernel function. And our objectives. And this is like a um, training process. I'm using like um, uh, I'm using a gradient methods kind of, and and the prediction function. So afterwards, we're fitting a Gaussian process model. You can see like it's fairly close to the um, 
to the uh, true true um, function. Uh, maybe like some of you might have like doubts on like what, why it's like like this rigid. It's just because um, I choose very um, very close points. I choose like um, I I think I choose like a thousand points within like this um, range, and I also have like some other um, kernels, and I have uh, written some like um, something right here. And if you're um, willing to um, just uh, willing to practice, you can like help tune this function and help uh, help it to uh, uh, help 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 using this new kernel function to build a caching process. And all right, so going back. Um, some evaluation of this uh, procedure. We're having a linear main function that represents our initial guess of the regression. And our posterior functions are just going to be concentrated close to the linear model because like, that's our subjective guess of, of this data. And every time when we update this, it's going to be just, being, just going to be very close to our um, original guess, but pulled away from the data. Um, uh, no, put away to the data. And the um, covariance functions, it controls the smoothness of the re realizations from the conversion process. So it's going to be really simple and flexible in terms of uh, conditioning and inference. What's the advantage of doing this? You can now fit a wide range of smooth surfaces while being computationally trackable even for a moderate to large number of predictors. What is the disadvantages? It's um, when you're trying to um, compute the mean and variance, there is a inverse term. And this term, you, uh, you would be using uh, the n-cube uh, 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 computational uh, complexity. So it's going to be a problem if you have a um, very large search space. So the solution is just we can do some parallelization. And because we, we right now uh, have more computational power. Um, one more thing to, to say before we go into acquisition function is um, like some of you might confuse Gaussian process with multivariate Gaussian. In short, Gaussian process can be considered as an infinite dimensional generalization of multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution. Uh, this is like the take home idea. But if you have some doubts on that, you can like um, go after me. So, yeah, question. Yeah, uh, would you like to know if I know estimation image? Yes. Uh, which one is that? Uh, the notebook. Yeah, so if I look at this uh, estimated uh, Graph, uh, it's pretty jagged, right? So you were saying that if you put more points, it becomes smooth. Oh uh, no, it's just like I put too much points, so therefore it looks like this. Okay. So uh, I'm going to say like uh, this looks like a pretty much as if like I had a calculator or some uh, stage-based model. Okay. Can you compare it with that and also? I would say. I would say they, they might look the same because it's different models. But um, if you want me to say something. Based on the same concept, right? Okay. So similar conception. If it's like the invasion updates, then like for sure there'll be some 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 parts that's similar. But it actually like depends on the Models itself, so it might be might be a special case of this, like same same kind of settings, but it's just you have to be really careful with like what, what kind of assumptions that you're going to move and you're going to tackle, kind of like objective functions. And also, uh, what about comparing this to uh, RMN or LSTM? Well, I I don't have like direct answers to this because they solve different questions. But there are also, um, like, there, I'm sure you'll find a lot of, like, um, iterations by, 
by, I don't know, like maybe good in that. But um, right now, following from this model, I don't have like more intuition to offer compared to like CNN or RN, that kind of stuff. Yes. So um, moving on to acquisition functions. Now we know like if we are having um, our patient settings and we are updating our points one by one, we could like um, like we could um, we could find like in the end we could find some uh, better sets of hyperparameters. So how do we like decide which point that we are going to evaluate? So what is firstly um, what does acquisition function mean? It's an inexpensive function. It, uh, specifically, that can be evaluated at a given point x that shows how desirable evaluating f at x is expected to be for the minimization problem. So um, this acquisition function, we could we could choose it like arbitrarily, but it won't perform well as we know. Also, we could like utilize in our model. So how do we utilize our posterior model to create such um, acquisition functions? What we have um, coming through is a set of like model hyperparameters, theta, and also an arbitrary query point x and its corresponding uh, function value v. And we could like map that into a utility function u. And actually like there are a lot of like names um, in this domain or the other domains about this, like maybe in Maybe you, if you study economics, you would be calling this expected utilities. And if you're doing some um, reinforcement learning, you could also know this by um, like, uh, like policy function or development integration, that kind. Um, so right now, the acquisition function can be defined as an integration out of all the parameters. So you see. Um, this, this part is uh, integrated out of all the hyperparameters, and this part is uh, integrated out of the uh, data, given like specific set of hyperparameters and also the data. And what's inside is the um, utility function. So this is like a expected utility function. This, it, it means like how, how desirable we want to evaluate this given point. So, if we deal with this function directly, it could be really complicated. So we just started from uh, the expectation over the unknown hyperparameters of theta. This is called marginalization. And um, we have this um, marginalization procedure, which is like we have this specific theta satisfied from, it actually satisfies some um, the posterior distribution of this. Which is like given your um, um, prior likelihood and over evidence is this this one, so it's um, estimated over this integrated out, and yeah, integrated out. So um, right now you have like two ways to tackle this specific um, acquisition function. The first one is to use point estimates, which you could use your um, CDA ML, CDA MAP and just substituted that into the acquisition function right now. So you have that equal. And the other way is um, you could sample it from the posterior distribution, which is like another hot topic of um, today's research areas is in, uh, by using um, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And so if you're doing sampling, then for sure you're just averaging them. Averaging like each point and you're Say you are sampling S points. Now you have like one over S is their weights. You can also like do some tricks to this, like tuning the weights of this. So if you don't understand like all the previous parts, it doesn't matter. The take home idea is that by far you you should know like we can't ignore this data right now, which is like we can ignore this right now. So um, what what kind of acquisition functions are we going to choose? There are um, three main categories. The first one is improvement-based policies. The second one is optimistic policies. And the third one, is, which is the most recent one, is the information-based policies. 
The first one, improvement-based policies, is how much is going to be improved from the current optimal value. And you could like calculate its probability or calculate its expectations. And the second one, optimistic policy, it means like it is um, it's based on your optimistic estimation. What would this evaluation give us? So um, quantitatively, it's um, when you're having a it's min value and you plus your estimated upper bound of that confidence interval. And the third, the third one is information-based policy, which means how much by evaluating this point can help us reduce the entropy. Um, so um, I have like uh, all three methods uh, uh, explained in details in the following slides, three slides. You can check them out, but I'm not going to cover them today. So uh, right now I'm going to do a demo. So this is borrowed from um, Second Optimize, which is a package for doing um, uh, hyperparameter tuning and optimization. And you see the problem statement is to um, find the minimum set of hyperparameters of X. And it has like explanations as we covered, like Bayesian optimization loop, acquisition functions, and we have this toy example, which uh, we use the same um, same function. And right now, what I want you guys to see is this picture, which is like when we are adding a new point, then we're going to um, we're going to restrict our estimation into some more reliable region. Like we, we can see like by adding this new point, this part has like been shrinked from this. And also like by adding this new point, this part has been shrinked and this like green arrow is the uh, confidence interval of that. So after doing all these, you have some estimation that's more close to your um, true estimation, like a uh, true generated model. Like the um, the green curve is more closer to the red curve compared to the very first picture that we have seen. And what's on the right right side is the acquisition functions that we have talked about, like the um, like the maximum. Each time we are choosing the maximum of the um, acquisition function, like we are choosing this this point, so we're going to limit to this point. Like this part has been trained of this. So this is going to be a like very um, straightforward demonstration of that. Like this is the like the final results of our um, patient optimization. All right, so right now we have covered the uh, patient optimization. So how do we make the par parallel? How do we um, utilize in our computational power and make it faster? Well, I'm just going to um, talk about the packages first, because I know like more people would be interested in this. And this is like a graph uh, from one paper uh, in 2015. And right now there are more packages uh, that you can do patient optimization, like second optimize. Right now you have like the constant layer methods. Which, I'm, which I'll be uh, demonstrating uh, later. And also GPIOpt, which is from a University of uh, Sheffield. This is like, uh, there is a lab created by uh, uh, like some professor. <laughs> right. So you have like the uh, SMAC algorithm, HyperOpt, Experiment. These are really fancy names, but um, as you can see, like it's um, models, like four of them are using Gaussian processes and one random forest and this is TPE and different languages. You can choose like whichever is future real, real needs. So um, how do we make this parallel? The first um, kind of approach is we go by um, finding different parallel, uh, find, finding different methods in Turing methods, uh, specifically the acquisition functions. Um, so 
the uh, square mean algorithm uses uh, Monte Carlo acquisition functions when you're trying to acquire some, um, a bunch of points at the same time and you're like having them together and you're trying to integrate them and combine that into one estimation. And like another paper from last, uh, last year, uh, MOE, which is like designed by Yelp's lab, it uses QEI, which is, um, EI is as we have talked about before, it's one uh, specific uh, acquisition function. It, it's uh, having two points pending in that here right now. And right now you're constructing an unbiased estimator of the gradient of this. And it's using like gradient methods to do all this. And the second kind of approach is to entropy search, um, which you consider a distribution of the minimum of the function and iteratively evaluating points that will most uh, discrete the entropy of this distribution. And there's a paper on 2013, it's called, uh, it's, it's gonna be like um, parallel, um, it's gonna be better if you have like, say, very similar um, um, sub models and you're trying to tune the parameters over them. So you don't like perform it again and again and again. Actually uses like added dependencies to this. So this is like, when we are assuming the three processes, they are separate and we are fit in this. This is a result. You can see it's like not, very, uh, not quite close to this. But if we are having like the dependencies of the three similar processes, then we can fit this process better. So this is like another um, idea of like parallelization. So what I'm going to demo is called constant layer, which is when you're having a um, bunch of points um, sampled and you want to evaluate and they're pending at like certain point and you're trying to um, use your acquisition function to give it the next point. And you are acquiring those points and you're assuming those points have the same um, constant target value beforehand. And you're adding those points to your um, model and you fantasize that. So you could have that um, constant be your minimum, be your maximum, or be a mix, which is like um, some value be uh, between these two. And then you can like have these, when you see like the constant uh, CL max, CL min, it really has some, some kind of like um, better performance over the others. So, so what I'm going to demo right now is um, how do like um, two hyperparameters with parallel Bayesian optimization in real life I'm going to use um, the Boston housing data sets and it has like 14 features. One, uh, the median value of the owner, um, uh, uh, like the, all right. So yeah, the, the housing values like in a you thousand know, dollars, this is the uh, response variable. And the other uh, 13 variables are just the, um, the regressors, the features. And this, this data set has been chosen for uh, doing a lot of benchmarks. So I think I, I found it like a very easy to compare with the other models. So I choose this data set. And the first step, um, we're using H2O to build this uh, gradient boost and regression model. First of all, like um, we um, import H2O and we start the um, initiating. And now we load the data and we parse the data. And we view um, the data sets. You see, like um, some of some of them are um, categorical or um, like binary. But like it doesn't matter if we're trying to use them as our regressors. So, what would a default GBM given us? Um, this is a result. We don't have to add more parameters to this because we're using the default. Um, afterwards, we think we want to do some cross validations and we're choosing some um, specific, um, like we're manually choosing the hyperparameters and doing the FIFO cross validation. And we're doing, given this. So this will, this, this will be just fitted in like seconds. 
and we have like the H2O fitted results, which is really nice. I summarized it. And what we care about is like, uh, since we're doing cross validation, we care about the min square arrow, uh, RMSE and MAE. Suppose right now, what I really care about is the um, MAE, which is the um, uh, main absolute arrows, which is like the arrows and you take absolute values and take the average of that. And um, I don't want to show like these kind of like bars because like I know they would be fitting a lot of models. So um, right now I'm disabling the progress bar. And um, what's right here is the uh, key point, which is I'm building the objective function, which is like uh, describe the main task. The main task is I'm trying to fit, uh, trying to tune these kinds of parameters with this model, which is the uh, um, H2O gradient boosting estimator. And I'm given um, all these sets of parameters. They're parameters, but like some of them, if you don't want to tune them, you could just put them there. What I care about is first first one is the maximum free depth and also my learning rate and also like how many um, data points is going to be the minimum of our lead points. So um, I'm, I really care about these three um, uh, hyperparameters. I put them into my model and I write them together. Um, this one is you train this model in like the X, Y training frame they're given as the same as before. And what it returns is um, I'm trying to pull from the cross validation matrix, uh, which are that um, there's one giant is, yeah, I think it's the stable. So what, what we care about is the min MAE, which is the first, first one of this first entry. And So right now, so um, right here, I'm pulling the summary out. I um, put them as a um, pandas data frame, and I call specifically the zero row and the min term, and I use that as a matrix and turn that into a flow, it's a lot of like transformations. And then I put that, uh, pull that out from its um, set into one specific value. Um, now, after writing this, I'll be um, curious if like this performs well. So, I test if our objective functions perform well. This is like a random set that I've given, and it calculates the um, mean MAE correctly. So, uh, the next step is I'm defining a space, to find a uh, hyperparameter search space for the max depth and learning rate and mean row, right now. And I'm using um, scikit-optimize. There is a Gaussian process minimize function for you to call. And so you're adding this objective function right now. You're defining the space. And you say, like, I'm going to call 100 points. And random states equals zero. And the acquisition function right now, I'm going to use EI. And acquisition optimizer is LBFGS, which is like something uh, beyond this talk. But these two options are uh, the default of this GPA might minimize, and then we are going to see the best scores of this. Uh, so after like, I believe it's like four minutes, and then the best score is computed as 1.95. And printed out the whole set of like best parameters, so like four, 0 0.08, and min row is because of one. <laughs> <laughs> so also I try like uh, by changing the uh, EI to PI, which is like the very first idea of um, representation function that gives like the best words equals to two point zero zero three four. You can change this by reading like the value of that. And last step is I'm going to um, draw a convergence plot, which is like the um, this is like the uh, MAE and it's like conversion. Uh, no, this is like the minimize function after each calls. So it's converging very fast. And after this, I'll be like closing this issue of instance. So, so yeah, um, this is all I have today. So if you have any questions.
Oh, please. Speed up curves for this? Do you have a sense of how efficient the parallel is? I don't have it right now. Subjective impression. Subjective impression would be um, like, because um, oh, sorry, like this. Uh, this is using uh, maybe it's like I limited this to specific um space, search space. So if you wanted this to um, to like um converge and converge to some specific of specific value very efficiently, then like your search space is also very important. No matter of, like what kind of algorithms that you're going to choose. Um, also, like what the current parallelization um, algorithms can do is they're taking account before you can, it's not really say you're doing your pending evaluations together but there's just like integration of all those points at the pending point. And so speed-wise, it's parallel, it's gonna be better. But it's, gonna, it's not like what we have imagined, like, like parallel um, um, one, two, three, four, five, six points. Like they, they like run together and they don't like, um, um, they're independently um, like, Working and they don't interrupt with, with, with each other, and they towards the like very last point. So that remains to be like some more research to be done, and also, um, what I was trying to say like Bayesian optimization is really going to be um, popular in the next few years, maybe. But like like it has started to regain its popularity since nineties, but. Um, like in the following years or decades, it's gonna be um, popular as well. So um, I was going to say like what the current Bayesian optimization might be limited is like there, like one of my like personal view, you could have not taken those serious is I think the um, optimization is only done by like statisticians and or like people who just do statistics. They think of like some general like way of statistically model modeling this and come up with a general solution to all kinds of models. But what I feel is like if you have like neural network specifically, then you don't have to wait until um, the end of the whole um, training. You could like maybe you could like get some points from the middle and then you can do some evaluations. It's just like there's no nobody's doing this kind of research saying like we could um, cater to the specific methods with this specific patient optimization. So, um, and also, um, what's more is, um, I think if you, um, but, but yeah, like, um, um, all in all, like, if you do parallelization, it's gonna be like better than you should do like um, single core, like one thread uh, from beginning to end. And that's going to be better than like grid search or random search right now. Like, yeah, that's that's my opinion. Okay, next. So question in regard to the complexity. You said that the complexity is beyond us and Q, uh, right? Is it with respect to the number of effective parameters or with respect to the number of other points in our data set? It should, it should be. It's the battery, maybe. So, um, it's, I think it's both because, like, for hyperparameters, it's your search and space is going to grow as your uh, number of hyperparameters grows. And also, um, like, if you have more data, then, like, uh, you're going to evaluate it more by doing, like, one, one, um, one iteration of your whole model over the whole data set. So, it's, it's going to be both. Else. I have a question. So what, what does the GBM stand for? As uh, gradient boosting methods. Why why does uh why is it using optimization? Where where do you use optimization? We use patient only for the uh hyperparameter tunings, which is like GBM has nothing to do with patient part. But, like if we have GBM and we have 
like several hyperparameters within GPM that we wanted to and that we could use Bayesian methods. Okay. And that's the same thing, right? Like the main difference between just searching for the data and putting some prior, it just does require less computational expensive. So we update like the data. Like you can see in your regression, we know how to find the of the result that you need prior to the Yes. Yes. And like the reason we end up doing this and using the data and stuff is just to uh, so that it's less computationally expensive and parallel. So it goes this way, because like linear regression, you know, like your model is fixed. Uh, specifically like least square regression, you know your model is fixed, that you are just going to follow the rules and do all the computation. But like for some like very complicated like black box algorithms, machine learning models, and whether it's supervised or unsupervised, it's going to be hard for you to find specific type of parameters to um, maximize or minimize. So therefore, um, you have like subjective guess. Say if you just build your first neural network, then you're gonna come up with some random like, or what you believe this model would be fit. So what Bayesian does is like uh, going from that model to Bayesian is you are having something educated guess, <clears throat> and help you limit down the times you could try, and help you get closer to the true um, or the best hyperparameters you wanna like set for your model. And is it sound possible with genetic algorithms? Have, uh, you also, pardon? have you heard about genetic algorithms? Yes. Like initially, like, yes. have a guess and then you add some mutation. Yes. Is it some kind of like yes. tumor? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? I just wanted to clarify the point about the scaling of the algorithm. Um, question in the back. Uh, so, naively, it's N cubed, but actually, uh, there is an algorithm that yes. with sparse matrices gets you to n square, and then more recently, there's an algorithm uh, by Dan Ford and Matthew called Solarite. And if you're willing to accept um, uh, a certain class of kernel, that gets you to, I think, n log. Wow. Right. Yes. It's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? I have a question. Uh, you, you know yes. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. So, which one do you refer to? Because, like, ID is not a good word for Bayesian stuff. ID, that, that was when I was trying to introduce the, um, like, uh, maximum likelihood at the MAP. So, yes. Please. How do you choose the acquisition? Like, like I said, is like people have some kind of idea, and we're just choosing one acquisition function and trying to. Going down the steps. So, like, um, it depends on like what kind of data you have. Like, maybe a specific acquisition function works for a specific type of data sets. So, yeah, it's also like some based on your experience as well. Okay. Anybody else? So, uh, on the acquisition function, uh, you you basically like change instead of optimizing for your objective function, which you said like is complicated, but it's uh, expensive to evaluate. You evaluate your, you maximize for your acquisition functions, you optimize for that, and then you go and, and uh, apply that on your black box, your black box uh, objective function, and then you have like uh, your point testing. And then my question is so, because I've seen that a notebook from Executive Optimizer before, okay. and it's like this, it's called sequential, sequential yes. optimization. Yes. Right. And because you 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 go you find the optimum of the acquisition function and then pass in a black box black box, black box uh, function, yes. you go back to our, your acquisition function, find the next optimum, right. and you go back and forth. That's why it's called sequential. Yes. And uh, I was I was wondering why it's called parallel because you you are doing still the, the same sequential. Well, it's called parallel because um, when you're evaluating points to be fit for the acquisition function. When you're choosing the maximum value of that uh, acquisition function, you're not evaluating one point. You're evaluating a bunch of points that you can maybe sample, or you maybe you can just estimate from, from like different things. So like the so acquisition. So you evaluate many? You, yes. You try to find local optimals in the uh, uh, acquisition function? Is that right? If, like, if you could say like it's different points, like maybe they're away from each other, but like if you are considering like just a bunch of points, then as a local, then I would say yes. But like, um, 
Uh, and I also want to correct you for one point because you just said like maybe it's difficult for you to evaluate the uh, acquisition function. No, no, you, you, yes, right. The objective. The, the actually, yeah, right. It's like the objective function, which is really hard to compute. Yeah, but yeah, like yeah. the acquisition function is really it's easy, easy to, to compute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And like what we are trying to do, you say like uh, when I introduced the acquisition function, it's actually that it's vector, as I said, it's, it's vector utility of all points. So. What's parallel is over there. It's not like uh, there are, there are actual like algorithms being designed or to be designed for the actual like parallel, as you can imagine, like one, two, three, four, five going together. Like that's not right now. Right now, the parallel is just meaning of like when you're at the pending part and you're trying to do parallelization over there. Okay. Yes. Anybody else? All right. So um, if you have more points, uh, feel free to. Um, Reach me, uh, re reach out to me by email or through mm -hmm. H2O. So, and also uh, just uh, partic participate to more of uh, these kind of commu uh, community events because I, I myself on a very um, like informative, especially like as I just transferred to um, the machine learning part, uh, machine learning domain last year. So, this uh, I, I found it really helpful. So just just uh, make sure you participate to more events like this. So thank you so much. Okay. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a good evening. Yeah. Yeah, you work with but um, the other question I had was, so all of your things were not fully vision, right? So you could you can optimize you know, in a vision way. So have, have you thought about that? And then you, you could actually, you know, you could actually put prior and whatever, you kind of, you have your coherence, and you can sample from under so you're not doing it doesn't seem like you're doing that. It seems like you're doing you have like fire on the right? Or, uh, right? So, so it seems like you have some approximation of the basic solution. Like the fire is not on the temple. So you stamp one you're already stamp one from the government from the way you said something from uh Oh, I see. You didn't walk through the phase and talk through the network because I thought it was a lot of Yeah. Okay, guys. Can you just stand it all for that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, my stand is on the way. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have it. Yes. Uh, and have, have you yeah. thought about just yeah. running to yeah. put the data up and run the chain separately? Is that is that something like
and how can you find it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like the first one. <laughs> oh, you guys will look all these lines. Okay, let's see me here. I think we all see it. As a result, like you said, okay, yeah, I probably give you a good call. That's good. Then we can be able to do something. So, you can send me what I can do to play.